exciting event. Uh, welcome to Jeff back to the LSE. Um, as you all know, Jeff is uh, one of the most important economists in the world. And, and of all the economists I know, uh, he has done more uh, to make the world a better place. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Microphone. If you like, in how you can make a difference uh, by really good economics, linked, of course, to extraordinary powers of persuasion, uh, which is the other bit that you've, uh, you've got to have. Um, Jeff is a, a, an old friend of the school. Uh, he first came here in 1981, he's first to my knowledge. Uh, when we had a summer institute on stagflation, which was the subject on which he originally made his name. Um, shortly afterwards, he became a full professor at Harvard at the age of 27. Um, he then moved into stabilization and economic reform, uh, and uh, the first country was, uh, was Bolivia, uh, and then followed a whole sequence. Uh, Poland was one of them, uh, and uh, Jeff must have given many lectures from this platform, but certainly uh, some of the most memorable were his Robin lectures on the Polish transformation. Uh, then he became very much involved in Russia, uh, and uh, we had a group from LSE that worked really closely with Jeff's group in Russia. That was an interesting time, as you can imagine, um, but uh, no time to tell those tales. Um, but then Jeff made a big break, I think it's fair to say, and moved into world poverty uh, and went to uh, Colombia, became advisor to Kofi Annan uh, and now Ban Ki-moon, and was the prime mover behind the UN Millennium Goals. Uh, and now, again, uh, to my uh, surprise, we're in touch again because he's become a fan of well-being, uh, which is really wonderful. And in fact, my belief that well-being will uh, take off as a fundamental concept um, in public policy uh, doubled, I can say, uh, when I uh, had this email from Jeff uh, saying that he was interested in it. Uh, and the result is going to be a big UN conference uh, in April uh, on that subject. So it's a real delight uh, to have Jeff here. Um, we are actually, the series is actually Yes, the 21st birthday lecture series of the Centre for Economic Performance. Um, so uh, who better to participate in that uh, than Jeff? And um, I, I think it, uh, it probably was also very convenient for him uh, to, uh, to do it because uh, he is using the event to launch the arguments, really important <laughs> arguments, <laughs> of his uh, great new book uh, on the price of civilization economics and ethics after the fall. So, uh, Jeff, tell us the story. Great. Richard, thank you so much, and happy birthday to the center. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Happy birthday to the center. And, uh, yes, I've been following in your footsteps, and I will follow you to happiness. Uh, you, you promised to lead us there, and I uh, am uh, absolutely desirous of uh, finding happiness together with you. Uh, we, had, we, we had a wonderful gathering uh, in Bhutan, the, uh, the world hotbed of happiness, uh, gross national happiness, uh, together a few months ago. And Bhutan sponsored a resolution which dozens of countries co-sponsored calling on putting happiness at uh, the center of national development agenda. And uh, there will be the world's first UN conference on happiness and development in the spring, as, as Richard said. So it's very exciting uh, possibility. I'm very happy myself right now because this is literally my favorite place in the whole world to speak. Uh, that's not just pandering to the audience, but I would do that anyway. But, <laughs> but it's actually true. I love this room, and I love the concept of LSE, and, uh, and I love being here. So thank you very much for, for making that possible. Now on to unhappy subjects. That would be the United States. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're going to talk about uh, unhappiness and how to recover 
happiness in the United States uh, for uh, this evening. This book is the book that I absolutely never expected to write. Um, many people will wish probably that I never did. Um, and uh, that I wrote because the US uh, has arrived in a kind of funk uh, and a social crisis that I did not expect to see um, ever occur. And I've turned to the US not out of uh, some great uh, desire or need because basically when I began studying economics and, uh, and uh, became an economist more than 30 years ago now, I consciously uh, said to myself that the US, it didn't need me, didn't necessarily want me uh, as, as an economist, uh, that the problems uh, internationally were more important, more urgent, more interesting, I felt, and uh, the ones that I wanted to spend my time on. And so I never really studied the United States uh, economy except to an extent as a comparative case uh, when I worked on stagflation or on uh, stabilization of, uh, from the 1970s and early 1980s, and then more and more uh, spent less and less time on the United States economy uh, as I became more concerned with problems of, uh, of uh, economic development, especially over the last 15 years. But I think the US crisis, uh, while it's by far not the worst crisis in the world by any stretch of the imagination, and the US by the standards of almost all the rest of the world is doing just fine, and it would be hard for many people to define it as a crisis, period is in a kind of crisis. It's a very particular one. It's a crisis of a country that succeeded in achieving a very high level of prosperity and a very high level of uh, inclusiveness uh, in uh, society. Indeed, when I was growing up as a uh, young person in the Midwest of the United States uh, in the Detroit area, I was told and I believed and it felt that the US was a middle class society, that everybody was part of the middle class except for uh, the fact that uh, we needed a civil rights movement obviously to include the African American population which was not part of the middle class, but that for the vast majority of the society was a middle class and inclusive society with very high social mobility. And this was the hallmark of America. And it was a great feature of America. And the United States has uh, still an unbelievable depth of capacity, which I think is, um, it's not unique, but it's astounding. When I visit campuses anywhere in the United States, and I do very frequently, no matter how small the college and uh, how small the student body in a liberal arts college uh, in West or the South, the quality of faculty and students is outstanding. Uh, the depth of knowledge, the uh, intensity of engagement is extremely high. It's very impressive. But with all of that description, the U.S. is absolutely squandering this right now. Uh, it hasn't lost it, but it is not reinvesting in it in this generation. And the US social and economic and political context and institutions are deteriorating. And that's not just in relative terms. Of course, we're living in an age of economic convergence. This is a backdrop to almost everything that's happening in the world. Uh, almost every not almost every country, but almost every region of the world has significantly unlocked institutional and technological secrets of economic development at this point. And there is a very powerful force of catching up underway, which is very, very exciting. And it is the main propellant of the world economy right now. 
and it's the reason why uh, the developing countries really have been decoupled from the crisis of the North Atlantic since 2008 and have been able to uh, maintain growth rates of around 6% per year even as the U.S. and Europe have been floundering at between 1% and 2% per year because the power of that catching up. So relative decline, if you want to put it that way, uh, meaning uh, that China, India, Brazil, Africa uh, are now able to achieve faster economic progress than the high income world. That I think we can take for granted. But I don't think that we should take for granted the fact that this has to mean an outright deterioration in the quality of life and I would say in the happiness of people in the high income world. But I feel that the United States is squandering its strengths right now, doesn't recognize them. The institutions in American society uh, that uh, are crucial for you know, propelling these strengths to the next generation are in a state of deterioration. Our political system is profoundly corrupted. Our social institutions, uh, like our public schools, are absolutely in crisis. Our workplaces uh, are uh, now seething with uh, inequality uh, that didn't exist. Uh, institutions like trade unionism uh, have been battered uh, out of the private sector and have a foothold only in the public sector. And even there, they're under unprecedented assault by right-wing politicians right now. And the sense of society as a society is probably more under attack than it has been in decades. And all of this uh, is coming at a very complex time of economic adjustment. So that's why I felt I had to try to understand all of this. And as a first foray into it, I'm not sure I got it as deeply as I wanted, but what you see in this book uh, is the third manuscript. So. Uh, because uh, each time I felt I had to dig deeper than what I was looking at. Uh, and Annika Cha, who suffered through all three manuscripts, he's here as my research assistant for this, will know out they went uh, because uh, they required rethinking. It was easy to describe the U.S. as in a post-2008 crisis. That was simple. It was dramatic. It was a phenomenal uh, event around uh, the weekend of September 14th. It was probably the biggest financial crisis, well, certainly the biggest financial crisis in world history in absolute terms and even in relative terms, pretty substantial uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a huge event. But focusing on that is a misunderstanding. The economic crisis is not uh, the financial crisis. It's not the end of the housing bubble. Uh, if it were, we would be in economic recovery now. The stimulus would have carried us uh, back to economic growth, and we wouldn't have a congressional approval rating in U.S. public opinion of 9%, uh, which is uh, definitely within statistical error of zero. Uh, and uh, I'm still yet to meet any of the 9%, because I don't know anybody that feels that this is a normal uh, political uh, environment or even uh, a representative democracy right now uh, because the opinions and policies that are being pursued are not representative of American public opinion. So this requires something deeper to understand this kind of crisis. Please understand I'm not saying the U.S. is alone in this, but the U.S. is a very interesting case for two reasons. One is it's still the world's biggest economy. It still is the center of the international monetary system. It still is capable of doing great good and obviously is capable of doing great harm as well. And the worldwide financial crisis of 2008 was a US-made crisis. And so that's an example of the harms. That's one reason why this case is important. The second reason why it's important as I start to get into it is that the US reached a high level of prosperity before any other large economy. Uh, and this 
image of an economy that can't live well with prosperity is really an eye-opening challenge. We should not be feeling a crisis right now. We should be happier than we are. We should not have gone through 40 years of economic growth over the past 40 years and feel more miserable, more anxious, less secure than we did before. The Easterlin paradox isn't inevitable, is it, Richard? No, good, okay. <laughs> so uh, we shouldn't accept at face value the idea that life satisfaction is stagnant despite economic progress. And the U.S. therefore poses a challenge, uh, an economic, psychological, sociological, and political challenge for us all to understand, which is really about the nature of well-being in, uh, in a prosperous society in the early 21st century and why it's so hard to enjoy life. One of my favorite essays of economics, period, uh, is uh, Economic Possibilities of Our Grandchildren by Keynes, written in 1930, which I'm sure that many of you are familiar with. And if you're not familiar with it, read it tonight, um, just before you open my book. Um, <laughs> but Keynes you know, had uh, two uh, powerful things to say at the depths of the Great Depression, one completely right and the second completely wrong. Uh, the one that was completely right is he said, you know, we may feel uh, poor and, uh, and uh, in a difficult straits right now, but by the time of our grandchildren, there will be no more poverty uh, in uh, our countries. And he was right about that in the absolute sense. Uh, and that is that the economic problem, as he called it, would be solved by the law of compound growth of technological capacity. He called it exactly right. What he got exactly wrong, by the way, fascinatingly, because he was, of course, one of the greatest minds uh, that ever lived, uh, he got completely wrong the central puzzle that he thought prosperity would pose, which is, what the heck are we going to do with all our leisure time? Uh, because he said that by the time we solved the economic problem, of course, we'd have more time on our hands and we'd all be worried about the arts and poetry and, and uh, leisure and we'd have nothing more to do and it would only be the madness uh, of those few uh, psychopaths, uh, I don't remember exactly the word he used, but it was a clinical term, uh, that uh, had the derangement of mind to still be pursuing money. And uh, he clearly really called that one wrong. Um, and that's in a sense a parable for the US because we reached everything and more than he said, but we have fallen apart in being able to live humanely at the same time. And that's the puzzle that I'm trying to understand in this book. So if this works, if not, we can go have a drink. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm getting a little green light here every time I press it. Ideas, organizers? <laughs> Somehow there's a presentation here. So, um, technical assistance. If not, I can talk, by the way. <laughs> but the pictures are. I want to start with the picture if I can, and if not, I'll tell you about the picture. Uh, oh, good, I see some slides behind that. Wonderful. That looks familiar, too. <laughs> Good. Wonderful. Bravo. Okay. Thank you. Real time. I think that these
these two uh, pictures tell a lot that, that we need to understand. The first uh, one on the left has more or less become uh, famous since the Occupy movement began uh, a few weeks ago because now it is finally being discussed in the United States after being neglected for a long time. It shows one measure of the remarkable increase of inequality in American society during the past 30 years. Uh, the top blue line on the left is the share of household income received by the top 1% of households. And the red line underneath it is the share of household income received by the top 0.01% of American households. There are 120 million households in America. A quintile has 24 million households. Uh, and 1% uh, uh, obviously is 1.2 million households. And the red line is 12,000 households. So what you see is the following. The US uh, has had a massive U-shaped uh, process of inequality over the course of a century. This graph starts in 1913. Inequality peaks by this measure in 1929, a rather uh, notable year, uh, at 23% of household income. And then comes the Great Depression, and the New Deal, and World War II, and then a long period uh, of the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s, where the US is still less equal than European counterparts, typically, but where the share of income received by the top 1% is 10% of household income, which by American standards, you see, is, is low. And this was a long period. And uh, this is the middle class society that I grew up in, uh, where one felt that, of course, there were rich people. But uh, the norms, the self-description, and a sense the credible development process of the time, which was building suburbia in America, and I'm a suburban kid, was a middle class, broad-based American phenomenon. This is 1981. I want you to remember that year, uh, because this is the turning point, actually, for a lot of the American political process. And this march up to today's very high level of inequality, though these data only go to 2007, due to uh, Piketty and uh, Syed's, uh, of course, who have maintained the most careful time series of this variable, brought the inequality back up to the pre-Great Depression period in almost a steady upward march. The same graph is evident for the top 0.01%, except there, the top 0.01%, 12,000 households, take home 5% of the household income, which is more than the bottom quintile. So the 12,000 households at the top have more income than the bottom 24 million households. And this is uh, a a remarkable fact. What's even more remarkable is how low the taxes are that are paid by the top, and that's a big part of, uh, of this phenomenon. Now, this other graph is absolutely startling also, in my opinion. This is the median earnings of full-time, year-round male workers. I chose male workers because they're the ones that are exposed predominantly to the globalization pressures of the last 30 years. <laughs> Male earnings in the United States at the middle of the income distribution peaked 38 years ago. What's absolutely remarkable about that is that GNP continued to rise in per capita terms at about 1.7% per year. But none of it reached the middle. The middle was stagnant for four decades now. And that not only says mechanically that the gains came at the top, which they did, but it also poses a remarkable puzzle uh, because it's astounding that income distribution, it's mainly saying the same thing. If you were to add on the mean incomes for the economy, they would continue to rise, of course. This is the median, and it's a reflection of this 
same phenomenon, though the dating here clearly puts it even before 1981. So something was happening even before 1981. So as I was trying to understand this, uh, because I think that this fact of mass, massive inequality, that is inequality not only of income and wealth, but of also political power and voice in America, is the predominant fact of our time right now. And it is the intertwining of the power and the incomes that are such an important part of our political economic scene. Understanding these two graphs is really the essence of uh, the first half of the book, which then asks the implications of that diagnosis in the second half of the book. And the argument that I suggest in the book is that we see, not surprisingly, an intertwining of two <coughs> phenomena, a market phenomenon and a political phenomenon that have a lot of powerful feedbacks between the two. The economic phenomenon, I believe, is the dominant fact of our age, which is globalization, which is the intertwining of national economies now at a nearly universal scale meaning that almost every country in the world is engaged in this process. And the political phenomenon is how governments in different societies reacted to the forces of globalization. Some governments leaned against it in the sense of recognizing that globalization posed challenges for society, for social equity, for inclusion, and that required a government response. In the United States, I argue, government amplified globalization by playing to the winners and further undercutting the losers. So rather than leaning against globalization, government went full in with globalization and amplified the inequalities that were resulting and that this has been going on for 30 years. The political, so as I was working through uh, uh, these ideas, trying to figure out what's the safe starting point for understanding this phenomenon. And you start in 2008, and you say there was a big crisis there. Well, that's not the starting point. When, where did that come from? That came from uh, the financial deregulation at the end of the 1990s, uh, which made it possible to have uh, the kinds of uh, unregulated financial monstrosities like Citigroup uh, alive and, and take hold to do the kind of damage that they did. Uh, where'd that come from? You keep peeling back and I found that the transition era uh, for me and the kind of break point in this process of, uh, oops, of a process uh, like uh, the one shown here of this uh, long, flat period of uh, lo relatively low inequality, or the break of this graph uh, in the 1970s was the instability of the 1970s itself. The US and a lot of the rest of the world after World War II, of course, had decades of strong economic performance. In the US, it was just economic growth. In Europe, it was first reconstruction recovery, and then strong economic growth. And the 1970s was a tumultuous period because the monetary system broke down early in the decade. Uh, in August 1971, we had the first of the oil shocks in 73, 74. We had the first of the food price shocks uh, in 73, 74. We had uh, a rise of uh, dollar-based inflation uh, in the 1970s, and we also had the rise of uh, global competition uh, that was very unusual, marked first by the dramatic uh, surge of Japan uh, in the world economy, and from a U.S. point of view, the first time that the U.S. felt strong international competition in the core of its industrial base. Uh, the uh, manufacturing base and especially the automobile industry, which was uh, a core of the American economy.
economy. Turns out that not only did the median wage of males peak in 1973, but manufacturing employment looks like this graph as well, but it peaked in 1979. And a year before that peak, probably the biggest event of uh, the world economy occurred, uh, and that unrecognized at the time, but looking back was when Deng Xiaoping came to power uh, and created the biggest uh, underlying change of the world economy, which was that not only was it now Europe, the US, Japan, uh, and a few small Asian countries that were part of this world market, but now suddenly 1.3 billion people uh, in China were joined in this world market. And that would be followed by India a little over a decade later, uh, by the rest of Latin America and by Africa in, during the past decade, to the point where we have an integrated global system to a very substantial extent. Now my view is that there were huge gains from globalization, certainly worldwide globalization has been by far the biggest promoter of poverty reduction of uh, any uh, economic phenomenon because it is the, it's the transmission belt of productivity and technology. And it's what's made it possible for China in three decades to reduce its poverty rates from around 50% to under 10%, probably well under 10% today. So globalization is not a zero-sum game by any means. It's a, as Mark Wolf here has written so eloquently, uh, it is a, absolutely a positive-sum game because it spreads the quintessential non-rival good, which is knowledge. And that's the most important phenomenon of globalization. And that's happening, and that's what leads to catching up growth. But globalization also has huge distributional implications. And the distributional implications are pretty well understood, but I think not uh, salient politically. Uh, what we know from economics uh, is uh, even from basic hectoral lean theory, uh, we know that uh, the uh, scarce factors uh, uh, are likely to see, uh, if, if the United States uh, is trading skilled labor uh, and importing uh, unskilled products, uh, the skilled laborer is likely to see a rise effectively in the terms of trade and its real incomes. And the unskilled labor, which is now competing with the abundant factor abroad, is likely to see a decline. And that's one of 10 useful models that all lead to a similar conclusion, which is that there will be winners in globalization that include high human capital, and high financial capital. And there will be losers in globalization, mainly the stay at home, and I don't mean home, stay within the country, non-mobile, low, relatively low skilled factors of production. That means people who don't have uh, the good fortune to have uh, a, high, a high level of educational completion or have, don't have special skills that uh, a broader world market economy empowers. And when globalization began to hit the US, but also Europe, and within Europe, adding in Central and Eastern Europe had this effect on a smaller scale, there were significant distributional consequences that in my view required policy attention. And the main consequences were a widening of inequality where the rich would get richer and the poor uh, would uh, either face stagnation or even uh, outright declines of living standards. And that would be the normal way that a democratic society would respond to such a pivotal uh, and tumultuous change. This did not happen in the United States. In 1980, Ronald Reagan won the presidential election and brought to government a set of political forces and a set of ideas that have been with us now for 30 years. And we're in the 30th anniversary of this change of direction. And it has been disastrous. 
on January 20, 1981, Reagan made a statement, which I think is the most important statement of a modern American president in the domestic uh, economy. When he said in his inaugural address, government is not the solution to our problems. Government is the problem. I say, if you believe that, please don't run for office. <laughs> we actually need presidents who believe in the positive, affirmative ability of government to solve problems. Reagan did not, and more importantly, the political and the economic forces that he helped to bring to power also did not. Reagan introduced a framework for American policy that has remained remarkably stable for 30 years and that no president has changed. This involved first the idea that the goal was to cut government's role in society and that the starting point for doing that was to cut high tax rates on wealthy people. That was the first and probably the most important motivating cause of the whole administration. As long as you could get the top marginal tax rates done, you were accomplishing something very, very big. But the number one step of the Reagan administration was to cut the top marginal tax rates from 70% down to 28% on personal income tax from the beginning till the end of the Reagan term. And they have stayed low from that point on. They're currently at 35% for regular income, and they're at 15% for capital gains, which is even more outlandish uh, and, uh, and shocking. And they're at 15% if you happen to be a hedge fund manager uh, and uh, enjoy what is called in the American tax code carried interest, uh, which is uh, taxed at, uh, at this uh, absurd, uh, absurd rate. The second thing that Reagan did was begin to dismantle basic government services and public investment. The notion of public goods almost left the public discourse. The idea that there are things that government has to do because markets cannot do them efficiently or effectively, one of the core pillars of the London School of Economics in its long history, was abandoned. Uh, in public discourse by a large part of the elite and a large part of the public debate. And we have had a shocking dismantling of basic public services and public investments over the course of 30 years. I'll show you that in just a, a few, few minutes. The third area that Reagan uh, championed was deregulation. And in certain areas, perhaps this was meritorious. Probably it played best in transport. But it was disastrous uh, in uh, two areas, unambiguously disastrous. One is in finance, where financial markets were progressively deregulated until the 2008 calamity. They were deregulated in steps. The first step was the savings and loan industry deregulation. That was so good, it uh, ended the savings and loan industry uh, in a phenomenal uh, bollocksing up uh, in uh, the mid-1980s, which was a dry run for the 2008 crisis. Uh, it led to a mere $150 billion bailout uh, by taxpayers at the time. A massive amount of corruption and many of our favorite senators involved at, at the time, including John McCain. Um, and so uh, America's always great, there's always another chance. Um, and uh, even Newt Gingrich, uh, one of our most disastrous politicians in, in modern history, seems to be getting another chance these days. Um, it's the wonders of short memory uh, and uh, lack of facts. A lot of wonderful things can happen uh, to keep uh, history interesting. So deregulation of finance, and the second was deregulation of the environment. Uh, an aggressive anti-environmental uh, movement which has meant that the United States has done exactly 0.0, .0 on climate change uh, in the period since the 1980s, uh, including 
uh, having signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992 with ratifying it, and then never taking a single step uh, to uh, honor the US law, which it had signed, because under our Constitution, international treaties duly ratified are part of national law, but uh, none of it has uh, ever been, uh, has ever been uh, done. So this is what the Reagan revolution wrought. And in a context of globalization, uh, it has been, I should say the fourth thing was uh, an assault on trade unions. Uh, and that started with the, the firing of the air traffic controllers in 1981 uh, and really a very uh, conscious political and uh, socially mobilized uh, attempt to use the pressures of globalization also to bust unions. And there are many ways that one can do that in the US, but using replacement workers very aggressively, uh, changing the social norms of strikes, which is what the firing of the air traffic controllers did in the summer of 1981, played a very big role in that. So what has all of this meant? Uh, what it has meant is that the backdrop of economic change has been the progressive uh, dismantling of, uh, of the manufacturing sector. A piece of this is technology, but a very significant part of it is globalization. And I would say our profession has not properly sorted out the two to this date. Uh, it's more ideological argument than it is substantive argument. Uh, and so there's quantitative estimates are diverse. But if you carry this graph back, we peaked in, in employment at a nearly 20 million, and now we are uh, in 2011 at about 10 and a half million workers. So the manufacturing sector went uh, down significantly. This was the route to the middle class for high school educated male workers. It fell away. The only other route to the middle class for high school educated male workers is this other sector, is construction. The fact that we had a construction bubble as the manufacturing sector was declining is not a coincidence. It's part of the monetary feedback mechanism under uh, Greenspan. Because Greenspan's rule was pump up the money supply as long as inflation is low and the labor market is soft. And he kept pumping up the money supply, and there was no inflationary response. Instead, what there was was an incredible inflow of consumer goods from China, a massive current account deficit that was being financed by debt, that was being promoted by an aggressive monetary expansion that was signaled to Greenspan and the Fed by the weakness of the labor market. And we did create a couple million net jobs uh, in construction, and then those came crashing down at the end of the bubble. And this is why unemployment or employment is so grim in the US. There is no safety valve for uh, high school grads in the United States right now. Uh, and the chronic underemployment is not a cyclical phenomenon. Uh, it is a structural phenomenon that was covered up by a cyclical phenomenon. We had our bubble. The bubble burst. The Obama administration has been desperate to try to recreate the bubble. You can't recreate the bubble. I don't care how much is done on housing mortgages and cash for clunkers and other gimmicks. Households are tired. They took on a lot of debt. And you can't recreate a consumption binge. And even if you could, you wouldn't want to. But the politicians would want to if they could. But they can't, which is why it's not working and why the unemployment rate remains high. Now, because of these basic economic forces, those at the top of the income distribution have continued to do quite well. Uh, this would be me. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and you hope you, uh, in advanced degree, it still pays well. Uh, the labor market has remained strong. Uh, and 
this is where the elites come from, and they feel things are fine. What's the problem? And for the rest of society, those below the purple line, which is uh, the bachelor's degree, life has been, at best, stagnant or even declining. So this is a structural problem that opened up over, God, I don't have the dates here, but uh, this goes back uh, probably to uh, 1970, I would say, on, on this graph. I think it just got clipped off of the, something like that. Okay, but that's true. Uh, that's, what the, that's, that's what the graph would look like. Uh, Annika will send you the right graph. Uh, uh, now, this also shows up in unemployment rates, uh, which are also uh, steeply stratified by education levels. And all of this uh, is a phenomenon, in my view, that is uh, where unemployment is around 4% if you have a bachelor's or higher. It's around 13% if you don't have a high school diploma. Now, what's completely fascinating is that this has meant not only a divide of society, but it's meant the collapse of social mobility in the United States. The OECD looks at the correlation of parental uh, educational attainment and uh, maximum children's educational attainment or ultimate educational attainment. A high correlation signifies a high degree of stratification or relatively low social mobility. And the most recent OECD data show that the United States actually has the highest parent to child educational attainment of any country right now. Completely the opposite of America's mythos, which is that anybody can make it. But in American society today, if you grow up in a poor household, you are not going to get a college degree unless you're extraordinarily lucky among perhaps 10% of your cohort that somehow make it through this maze right now. So what did Reagan do? First, it's interesting to point out why Reagan. Again, underlying forces of demographic change, I think, have been crucial. Basically, uh, the Sun Belt has risen to the prominence of American politics. Uh, and since I'm from the Snow Belt, I'm not entirely happy with that. Because uh, the Sun Belt brings a lot of ideas, uh, mainly uh, anti-government, anti-Washington, anti-tax ideas that have a deep history and a deep resonance uh, in American politics. This is a sectional divide to a very important extent. And Reagan really represents uh, the rise of the Sun Belt George W. Bush exemplifies it. I need say no more. Uh, it's not good, uh, but it, it is uh, what it is for the moment. Reagan demonized taxation, and this changed the American political discourse. The idea that taxes are kind of normal public policy was replaced by the idea that taxes are near slavery. That if you pay a third of your income to taxes, it's like working uh, in thrall to the government for the first four months. And that kind of heated rhetoric became part of the American scene over the last 30 years. And of course, it touches nerves because America was founded on a tax revolt. And, uh, and uh, there, are, there are many things that one can pick up in public rhetoric. But the shocking part is that if you look at the tax to GDP ratio, of the high income countries. Every country in the OECD among the high income democracies had a rising tax to GDP ratio after 1965, except for one country. And that is, oops, the United States. <laughs> We're the only one that stayed roughly constant at about 18% of gross national income in federal taxes and federal, state, and local taxes at about 30% of GDP. Europe averages about 40. Scandinavia between 45 and 50%. And I mentioned Scandinavia because to my mind, they're the most successful economies in the world at putting the full balance of prosperity, fairness, poverty alleviation, and environmental sustainability. And they rank highest on happiness. Uh, so they have uh, something good going for them on all counts. And they pay a tremendous amount of taxes, of course. 
and they raise taxes tremendously. Here's Denmark, uh, here's uh, Sweden, Finland, and so on. The United States did not. Of course, this translates also in the US notoriously to the lowest level of social spending as a share of GDP. This again was already evident, but with a much smaller division in the 60s and 70s, but Reagan amplified this and put a break on this process after 1981. Here's what happened during uh, to the top marginal tax rates. This is uh, what all of our governments have been fighting over. Uh, you know, what's the sum difference between the Republicans and the Democrats right now, really? It's whether the top tax rate should be 35% or 39.6%. <laughs> it's absurd, actually. And that's the range of discourse. And Obama tries to keep the image of a center-left party, which is really a center-right party, by pushing on that 39% for the top tax rate. But this is a tiny adjustment in the scheme of things. And it fills the cable news and the airwaves, and it allows Democrats to position themselves as fighting for justice and allows the Republicans to position themselves as anti-tax uh, and all the rest. But really, the two parties are a duopoly on the right. And it's been pretty much constant like this since Reagan's era. Corporate taxes also fell from uh, what was uh, around 3% of GDP in the, seven, in the 60s, fell during uh, the 70s to about 2 to 2.5% 2 of GDP, fell again uh, after the 80s to between 1.5% and 2% of GDP, and now in the last couple of years, the corporate tax collections have been 1.5% of GDP, the incredibly disappearing corporate tax rate. And the biggest thing in Washington right now is an amnesty on the trillion, two trillion dollars or so estimated to have been accumulated in low tax international accounts so that they will, quote, be brought back to the United States to create jobs. And last time they were brought back, uh, they were brought back to create wealth uh, because this amnesty occurred a few years ago uh, and uh, Every study uh, afterwards found that it was uh, used for uh, share buybacks for uh, higher compensation of CEOs and, and uh, all the rest. Now here, to my mind, is the most destructive of all part of what Reagan did. Th these are the discretionary government services, what we would call the public goods uh, components of uh, the federal government. And they include all non-military spending other than the transfer programs like Medicare and Social Security. So these are the annual budgeted amounts for Congress, the judiciary, agriculture, commerce, education, energy, health and human services, housing, interior in the US means federal land management, justice, labor, for instance, job training programs, transport, which is highways, rail, and so forth, treasury, environmental protection, uh, National uh, Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA for all of our space programs, National Science Foundation, and the like. It's a lot. This is our government. This is our federal government. So how much do we invest in those things? Uh, at the end of the 1970s, we were investing between 5 and 6% of national income. I would have argued that's too little, but it was, uh, in comparison to what came afterwards, uh, a, a mountain of resources. Because when Reagan came in, this is what he went after. And so in addition to slashing taxes at the top, he slashed basic public services and public investment all over the place, in education, in research, in energy, in environment, in job training, in labor markets, in community development. It's quite pervasive. And this amount fell to between 2 and 3% of GDP by the mid-1980s for all of those areas of government. 
it's essentially a dismantling of federal government services. Now, mind you, the states still have the predominant responsibility for primary and secondary education, for policing, and so forth. But this is the federal responsibility. It remained low through all of the subsequent presidencies. This is why there's no real difference between Republicans and Democrats in the actual performance after Reagan, because the basic tenets cut the top taxes, slash government spending and on investment and services, deregulate the economy, has remained true through Clinton and through the first three years of Obama as well, except for the following. Obama went for a stimulus spending. Because unfortunately for Obama, macroeconomics predominated public economics. And by that I mean what the United States desperately needs and needed was an analysis of what government should do. And instead what it got was a, an analysis of aggregate demand, which in my view was not the right point of America's structural crisis. So Obama supported a stimulus which raised this spending from about 2.5% of GDP to about 4.5%, and then it came right down. And here's where we are right now. We're at about 2.5% of GDP, and in an agreement reached between the White House and Congress during the debt negotiations this summer, they agreed to cap the nominal increases of discretionary spending in a way which will drive that entire category down to below 2% of GDP by the end of this decade. It's essentially the dismantling of civilian government. The things that will remain are the military, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, veterans benefits, federal retirement, food stamps, and unemployment insurance at some level. So there'll still be about 20% of GDP, or 18% of GDP spent on those other categories. But what is spent on public goods and services will be under 2% of GDP. And this, to my mind, is why all of those structural problems will not be addressed and will not be solved, and why we're on a continuing downward spiral in the United States on the current trajectory, unrelieved by anything that the White House is doing. Now, I'm going to speed up uh, just to come to a conclusion. At the same time, the battering of unions, the cuts of tax rates at the top, the impunity that has been afforded to CEOs and to Wall Street has changed the social milieu in the United States. The top 1% is not only phenomenally rich, but phenomenally powerful, and also enjoying phenomenal impunity. It's become a lawless environment in the big companies, and CEOs are the most powerful people in the country, and the reason they are is that American corporate governance has no, has no real constraint on the CEOs. We have very dispersed shareholder ownership. Shareholder rights are very uh, lax and insecure. The uh, state of Delaware, where most of our companies are incorporated domestically, gives the maximum birth to uh, management. There are no unions inside, there's certainly nothing like co-determination to countervail any of this. And the normal way that a CEO gets appointed is the CEO appoints a compensation committee, pays them very well, and they pay him very well. And it's usually a him. And it's a great symbiotic relationship. Everybody can live very well, and CEOs in America make a fortune compared to CEOs in just about any other part of the world because of the weakness of corporate governance in the United States and because of the impunity that is afforded to them. So we've had our range of scandals, and the scandals on Wall Street and the illegality on Wall Street have been stunning. 
the end of the financial crisis was not only reckless gambling, but financial fraud. Every major Wall Street company committed financial fraud. They all did it the same way, so they weren't even creative in how they did it. Uh, they got together with a partner hedge fund. The hedge fund packaged toxic securities, which were marketed to a German state bank, uh, which also uh, were miserably managed and regulated. Uh, and uh, the hedge fund bet against the PAC. Uh, the, the bank got its fees. The uh, German uh, bank buyer lost all the money. Uh, the hedge fund owners like uh, John Paulson walked away with billions of dollars. And they only pay 15% uh, payment because it's so important to incentivize them on uh, their carried interest. And if you can believe how corrupt our politics uh, is to this day, even that has not changed because senators, including my senator uh, in New York State, have protected the hedge funds to this day because the hedge funds are among the most generous, quote unquote, campaign contributors to the US Congress and to the White House. And so they continue to walk away with this. Now, after these companies paid fines to the SEC, the hedge funds never even heard a peep that maybe they did something wrong as well. And so they completely walked away with billions and billions of dollars in this financial fraud. And this is nothing but impunity. If we saw it in an African country, if we saw it in a Latin American country, you'd be writing fulminant essays about how corrupt those countries are uh, and uh, how they can't govern themselves and this is an explanation for their poverty and so forth. Uh, and uh, those same essays need to be written about the United States. It is a massively corrupt system. Uh, and now a recent book by Peter Schweitzer, who's a fellow at the Hoover Institution about insider trading in Congress, has added to uh, the bill affair because it turns out I was too naive. I thought this had something to do with campaign contributions and maybe the revolving door, maybe hiring the families and staff of congressmen and so forth. But it also is direct, unvarnished, pure insider trading that's at play. Uh, and uh, Congress, apparently, I only learned it a month ago, uh, has uh, no regulation on insider trading. Uh, and uh, the major senators who are writing the health care legislation, the financial reform legislation, uh, the uh, food and agriculture legislation are trading on the decisions that they're making and trading actively and making a lot of money. And then saying when they're called on it, I would never let that influence my decisions. Uh, and somehow this passes for Democratic representative government in the 21st century. So let me come to the end. Capitalism cannot work this way without killing itself and killing society. An economy requires a moral base if it is going to function in the 21st century in a stable manner. It could get away with it when Three quarters of the population were illiterate peasants, perhaps, uh, another uh, base of society, but not in a democracy. Either we lose the democracy or we restore the functionality of government. Government has three fundamental things that it needs to do. One is it needs to provide public goods to ensure productivity and prosperity. We need an educated workforce. We need uh, a uh, infrastructure. We need support for science and technology. We need uh, the basic public goods to allow the productive sector to be productive. This is completely forgotten in American political day-to-day uh, -day discourse right now. Second, we need government to ensure boundaries of fairness and equity. And that is redistribution. But even more important, it is help for families and especially for children to ensure that any child in the society has a chance in that society. 
and whether you define it uh, as equality of opportunity or how you might put it, this also is not present in America right now because poor kids can't make it. The neighborhood effects, the family effects, the environmental effects, the pure uh, terms of trade effects that they face prevent social mobility. So we're losing a large part of society. We have right now, to give you just a couple of indicators, we're edu only 32% of our 25 to 29 year olds have a bachelor's degree right now. Uh, men, that's the number I have in my head. 25 to 29 year old men, 32% have a bachelor's degree, 68% do not. For Hispanic men, 25 to 29 year old, it's 11%. 89% do not. For African American young men, 16% have a bachelor's degree, 84% do not. In today's labor market, what kind of society are we building? We are building a society of extraordinarily weak labor force attachment, of low wages, high inequality, high insecurity, unless we address the social equity issue, and you can see that equity and efficiency will go hand in hand because we're losing the returns on human capital massively in the United States by leaving poor kids to scramble on their own. They're not making it. And the third thing we need government for is sustainability across generations. And that's the financial, it's ethical, uh, and it's also environmental and we're failing on those counts as well. So very briefly, on the fiscal side, we have the following mess. Even today, if you just take a snapshot of where we are today, but cyclically adjust, essentially we're collecting something around 15% of GDP in federal income today. Maybe, maybe it would be 18% if there were a cyclical recovery, if there is such thing as a cyclical recovery at this point. But our spending is around 24% of GDP, 13% in transfer programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, veterans, and all that, around 5% of GDP in the military. We will be at about 3% of GDP in uh, interest payments by the middle of this decade and some three to four percentage points for civilian discretionary programs brings you to 24% of GDP. So even with the business cycle recovery, our current fiscal arrangements would leave a chronic deficit of 6% of GDP. And our actual deficit is about 9% of GDP because we're collecting three percentage points of tax less than what I just said and maybe we're not even gonna bounce back because maybe there is no such thing as a cyclical bounce back at this point. We need a fiscal strategy. What would it be? There are only two things to do with the budget gap. You can raise taxes or you can cut spending. The Republican position and the de facto Democratic position is to cut spending sharply. We talk about an entitlements crisis. We talk about wasteful government and so on. The only place where we could cut sharply right now without cutting serious uh, needed programs is the military. We're spending about 5% of GDP on the military. Uh, one percentage point of that is just on two disastrous wars. So that's pure social loss. And probably another percentage point of that is another pure social loss. We could surely cut two percentage points. That's $300 billion from our $700 billion military budget and only feel benefit from that. But otherwise, we've been cutting for three decades. So the Republican position is now it's time to cut Medicaid, which is health for the poor. Or it's time to squeeze Medicare health spending, even though Medicare is about 3% of GDP, but total health 
spending is 17% of GDP, so Medicare is a price taker, not a price maker. If you just restrict, you restrict services. You don't solve the health cost crisis, which they don't want to solve because the health care lobby is very, very powerful. So the proposals from the Republican side are easy. We should close the Department of Education. <laughs> I kid you not. We, as Perry said, we should close three things. <laughs> Ron Paul wants to close five, and he remembers them. <laughs> and people take this seriously. I mean, hey, why do we need a Department of Education? What good is education? And you look at those candidates, and it's a fair question. <laughs> <laughs> and they want to close down any active labor market policies, any job training policies, any apprenticeship programs. <clears throat> And they, of course, want to close down the Interior Department and the Environmental Protection Agency. And they want to gut the spending on science, and they want to close down the Department of Energy because, hey, we don't have an energy problem. We got plenty of places we can drill in Alaska and offshore, and thank God climate change is a hoax anyway. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we don't have to worry about that. So that's the kind of fantasy world that half our political spectrum at the Washington level talks about. And the Democrats basically say, no, that's not right, but, but we'll go along with half of it, half of it, half of it. Uh, and that's how we get to the incredible shrinking government. Because neither side wants to tax, which is what you need to do to pay the price of civilization. And when you've spent 30 years accumulating vast wealth at the top and a vast inequality of income at the top, it's not hard to find out also how you could collect higher taxes at the top. We could easily raise personal income taxation for the top 1% of one percentage point of GDP and still leave, leave them way beyond uh, the uh, early 1980s in share of national income that they take home. Corporate income tax, you saw how it has declined uh, by one and a half percentage points of GDP. It's time for just a net wealth tax because of the accumulated net worth over the last 30 years. And a simple calculation, naive but simple, naive in the sense that it's not a sophisticated uh, um, uh, simulation, tax simulation, but just the back of the envelope is that if you just take portfolios at $5 million and more and just tax the basis beyond $5 million of net worth and tax that at 1%, you raise one percentage point of GDP. So that's another place to go. A financial transactions tax could raise another half a percent of GDP. Carbon tax, certainly we should have, and would also raise at something uh, around uh, 25 cents a gallon, would raise another half a percent of GDP. And tax compliance, the idea that maybe you should follow the law, uh, would actually probably raise beyond one percentage point of GDP. We have a massive loss of uh, AGI, uh, adjusted gross income, declared to the Internal Revenue Service compared to what they estimate it should be from the national account side, a gap of two to three percentage points of GDP uh, of lost tax revenues is, the, uh, is, is uh, a rough estimate. Of course, you don't know for sure. And that gives us four and a half percentage points of GDP. Now that, I won't go through all these numbers, but the basic idea is we need more spending to come back to civilization. We need uh, active labor market spending. We need more spending from the federal level on primary and secondary education for poorer communities. We need uh, more support for higher education. We need support for early childhood development. We need support for infrastructure. 
We need more investment in R&D, especially around renewable energy and sustainability. We also need support for a civil uh, and civilian approach to foreign policy because we have an all military, all the time approach to foreign policy right now. And so we should add on development aid as well. Well, if you go through the calculations of where we start with of about six percentage points baseline deficit, <laughs> and you cut what can be cut, and I even give 1% cut on the health spending through true reform of health care costs, you get down to three, but then I add back in three of spending that's needed that we're not doing right now to actually ensure a more inclusive and prosperous society. And then you pay for it. And in truth, on this chart, I haven't balanced the budget. What I've done is come up with outlays 24% of GDP, taxes 22.5% of GDP. And the excuse is that a deficit that small reduces the debt GDP ratio over time. So the debt GDP ratio peaks at around 70% of GDP and then starts coming down. And that, I think, is a reasonable budget. It's nothing like anybody's budget. Uh, it has no relevance to Washington discourse right now at all. Because the Washington discourse is uh, that the more libertarian of our candidates, so-called, would like to peak, have a peak of federal spending around 15% of GDP. And Romney's platform is that it would stabilize at 20% of GDP. But you can't get there without gutting government services. Obama's budget is also about 20% of GDP, interestingly enough. That's why his own plan has government civilian discretionary spending coming down to 1.8% of GDP. And when I asked his top economic advisor about that, I said, Gene, don't you think that's a pretty small number for all our government, for a president that wants to invest in our future? And he said, yeah, Jeff, we have a problem with that, too. And I said, but Gene, that's your policy. It's not your problem, that's your policy. And of course, he doesn't want to say a word about tax because that's the whole trick of American politics. Whoever says it, they think, loses. And that's what's so absurd about this. So what we do need is candidates that are ready to stand up and say tax the rich, that's it. And that's what the Occupy movement has started to do. And it has been 11 weeks in existence in the United States now. And so the legitimacy of our powerful institutions is so low that in 11 weeks, this rather small number of young individuals has changed the American discourse and provoked the authorities to come out with police and police batons to clear them away. Which is amazing because if you look at Zuccotti Park on Google Earth, you'll see it's a tiny, tiny little place that is insignificant in even Manhattan. But they couldn't stand the tents there because it was resonating with the American public that's, you know, they're onto something important. And within a few weeks, there were more stories, more op-eds, more editorials, more showing of that graph of inequality than I would say in the last 25 years. And that's why they've tried to close it down. Because they can't resist it, actually. Not because there wasn't public health. If you want to control public health, put three porta johnnies there like at uh, St. Paul's, then you can control public health. But they didn't want to control public health. They didn't want that image there. And so they sent in the police to stop it. But the American public resonates to this because a solid majority of the public wants to raise taxes on the rich, wants to end the wars, and wants to preserve the role of effective government rather stunning. This was my best and most hopeful point of this book, is that in reading dozens, maybe even hundreds of opinion surveys, 
over the last 10 years, I was hugely relieved. America is not the Tea Party. America is not Newt Gingrich. America is not Ron Paul. America is not Rupert Murdoch. America is not Fox News. Americans are pragmatic, realistic, sensible, decent people. You wouldn't know it from Washington, <laughs> but that's actually the truth. So the end result of what we really need is to restore democracy. Thanks. Um, actually genuine in actually offering to pay more tax? Or was, it more, was Warren Buffett more genuine in paying more tax or was it a bit of, bit of public stunt um, considering if he had been bailed out um, with all the derivatives he held, he could have been passed back in 2008? Yeah, so uh, you know, Warren Buffett uh, uh, has uh, been um, outspoken, which I think is uh, good and useful. Uh, for uh, the cause of uh, paying more taxes, though the way that this was translated by the White House was pretty wimpy, actually, uh, which is just to ensure that a billionaire wouldn't pay less in tax rate than uh, his secretary. Uh, that's how it was phrased. Well, we could do better than that. We could really tax these people uh, and tax them uh, and tax them progressively. But uh, I think that that's probably a genuine sentiment. Uh, one does get the notion that uh, Buffett really, really just likes to make money, uh, but that he's probably willing to pay taxes. But it's also true, he was a huge beneficiary of the bailouts. And the book by Peter Schweitzer, which I mentioned, which I think is, I think the title is Throw the Bumps Out, or some, something like that. Uh, really, it's worth looking. It's very illuminating, uh, really disgusting. Uh, it makes you mad, which a, a good book should or a good book often does, uh, but Warren Buffett has a chapter uh, devoted to the fact that he held a huge number of stocks uh, that depended on the bailout uh, to, realize, uh, their, uh, to realize his positions. And he was very actively involved politically in helping the bailout to go through. Uh, so he was definitely talking his book uh, along the way and talking his book publicly as well as talking the book privately. Uh, so I, I do think that this uh, is a real question and, a, and a, a real concern. I don't think it's our concern necessarily. Our concern is that Warren Buffett should be taxed whether he'd like to be or not. Uh, I don't think that this question is really trying to convince uh, millionaires and billionaires that they ought to want to be taxed. Uh, I think it is uh, helping the rest of the 99% of the population understand that we ought to tax those people. And when I give the talks about my book around the country, and somebody usually stands up and says, Professor Sachs, you're, you know, you want to raise taxes. And I ask them, I figured out to ask them, oh, are you, are you a billionaire? And they said, no. Are you a millionaire? No. I said, well, why are you doing their business? Uh, it's, they should pay more taxes. Why You're the one who is losing the public services, your children, uh, and all the rest. And the audience usually applauds at that point um, <laughs> on cue, which is good when you're giving a lecture. Um, but the real point is that we have this peculiar public discourse, which, of course, completely tries to uh, mix up the idea of, do you want to pay more taxes? And would you like wealthy people to pay more taxes? And I'm not so, you know, I don't want to be uh, sound like that's the only solution and 
of course, middle class people should pay tax and, and do and all the rest. But when you have such a lopsided income distribution, wealth distribution, one should start at the top. Uh, that's the right place to start in the, in the reform. Please. Ilari Aula, student over here. Thank you for a really interesting lecture on the rise in equality in the, inside the US. My question is actually that you seem to um, implement the main responsibility for reducing the growing inequality in the US to the government. Uh, my question is, on the global scale, we have rising inequality as well. Who has the primary moral responsibility to reduce rising inequality on the global scale as well? Thank you. We probably don't have globally rising inequality in the sense that the most important global phenomenon is the catching up growth of poor countries. And certainly the most single most important phenomenon of falling poverty is the near disappearance of extreme poverty in China, which has taken hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And I would say quantitatively, the second most important is the reduction of poverty rates in India. Now what's true is that within China, within India, inequality is rising. So this is not uh, necessarily uniform. It's got a bit of the old Kuznets idea that if you start out uh, as a largely uh, rural peasant society and a certain proportion uh, become part of the modern sector in the Kuznets, uh, um, uh, uh, in, in the Kuznets uh, illustration, you'll get rising inequality part and parcel with development at a certain I don't think global inequality is rising, but inequality within societies is very, is very serious, and in many, many countries it is rising. So there are some points of global inequality that are rising, though, and that is places that are the poorest of the poor, that I argue are trapped in a poverty trap and need help to get out, and often there are reasons why they're stuck at the bottom that are geographical, uh, or ecological, or disease burden, or some combination of those, or geopolitical. But my view has been, therefore, countries have responsibilities internally. That's the nation state world that we're in. That would address a tremendous amount. We should continue to have globalization and uh, champion the cause of catching up growth because that really is the normative desirable framework for a world that converges in living standards where the whole world is able to share the benefits of knowledge and technology effectively. And we should aggressively help places that are stuck at the bottom. And also the new phenomenon, of course, will be places that are devastated by anthropogenic environmental change. And that's the new crisis that's already underway. And it's not an accident that we're finding places that have all of the worst features that are impoverished to begin with and are getting hammered by climate change because a lot of the poor results from environmental fragility to begin with. So I'm thinking of the Horn of Africa, for instance, which is the most desperate place on the planet today. And millions and millions of people are at the edge of survival and many hundreds of thousands, millions will die. They won't, we won't even know it exactly because they'll die of infection, they'll die uh, not of uh, overt starvation, but they'll die of immunosuppression uh, and deprivation. And this is underway right now. When you notice the world barely cares about any of this anymore because the environment's so noisy, nobody pays any attention at all, which is also a very serious blow to the world. Uh, so the answer that I have for this is that if governments would do their internal job, if we maintain globalization as a <coughs> positive phenomenon, if we collectively address global crises like climate change, if we introduce a humane, uh, and we're very far from it, a, a humane global framework on migration, which is going to be essential in a world of seven, eight, nine billion people with absolutely asymmetric, massive shocks to environmental sustainability. 
And if we continue to target help for the poorest of the poor, then we can address that question <laughs> in a holistic way. So it's a mix of what has to happen internally and what has to happen globally. And on the global level, it's both attention to the poorest as well as attention to those who are hit by shocks. And the tools are both uh, direct income transfers, technology, and migration. And we don't have that framework. Uh, and one of the things that's happening is the US leadership is collapsing. We're in a fulminant retreat of US leadership on everything but military technology right now. And if you read, for instance, Hillary Clinton's speech in Busan last week on aid effectiveness, it's a worth reading. It's horrible, uh, actually. <laughs> because uh, here's a speech on aid. The word poverty, as far as I could see, I skimmed it, and I'm being a little hyperbolic, so somebody will say he was wrong. It appeared once. Uh, but I, don't, I didn't see the word poverty once. And it was all about how aid, anyway, doesn't really matter. It's now uh, all capital flows, and what really counts is business investment and so on. So it's not really the money, it's the investment. And there was no conceptualization of any of the issues I just mentioned. That there are places too poor, that there's environmental shocks, that there's disease burden, none of that. It's a collapse of thinking, nearly complete in Washington right now, and a collapse of will. And one of the things, by the way, that uh, the Republicans in particular want to do is close down all foreign assistance. In literally those terms, let's close down all foreign assistance. So this is something else to factor in. Charles Kindleberger wrote a classic account of the Great Depression, uh, the interwar period remember the book uh, title. But it's uh, one of the most important accounts of the Great Depression. Kindleberger was an MIT economic historian, had one core idea which is riveting and right, which is that the Great Depression couldn't be solved because UK leadership was past and US leadership was not yet present. And so there was no provider of global public goods in the late 20s and 1930s. We are in that environment again today. We have no provider of global public goods. So hang on. <laughs> Jeff, I think you're going to have to start uh, Okay. Start your signing. But uh, I just wanted to say, um, I, 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 I draw three lessons from what Jeff said. Uh, first, is this working? Yeah. I'm drawing three lessons from what Jeff said. First, that uh, one should never stop questioning the conventional wisdom. One, one should always be willing to ask awkward questions uh, and look for one's own answers. And, and finally, in the end, if something doesn't make sense to you, if it doesn't make sense, don't fall in with it just because it's what people say. And I think that what we've seen this evening actually is an absolute object lesson in independent thinking and not, not just falling in with, with what everybody is saying. Um, and it's also been a great experience. Thank you very much. Thank you.